Congrats, everyone. Boop, boop, doop. Morning, Alexandra. Hey, Sunny. Hey, Mina. Morning, Jen. Just seven of us to do this, That's funny. That is funny. You requested Reptar. Cool, cool. I've got plenty. I literally have like 20 more. So there's no stress, Alexandra. You've got, there's, there's literally plenty. Um, that's why I did that last call so that nobody had to like worry if they were going to get it or not. Morning, my stubborn friend. I am a stubborn friend. She's right. But, but counterpoint, I'm a good friend who loves her friends and takes care of them. Someone shops at Costco, it's true. Someone does shop at Costco. Although you can get that exact thing on Amazon because um, prior to me stealing my sister's Costco membership, I did used to just buy that exact same thing there. So what do I think's going on here? Um, no, I'm not a good friend to me. I'm a good friend to you. I got my first butterfly from the book. Oh, that's exciting. Wait, tell tell me what your what was the but what did the butterflies come from? What did they come from? Tell me everything. I want to hear about it. They have pallets of those. Yeah, that makes sense. I could see that. I could see that. Morning, Julia. I added you on Goodreads this morning. I saw your request when I got up and added it. Um, apparently 100 no, 80, 85 more books are coming to me. Saturday and then the next 30 are coming on the 4th. So pretty much everyone who pre-ordered it will have theirs mailed out by the 4th once all of those come in. So that's good, right? I think it's good. Your book goes today. Oh, yay, Anya, I'm excited. I can't hear what you think. Oh my God, what do we think is going on over here? This is rainbow. Sawyer this morning says, I'm staying home, not you, Ellie. Uh-oh. Uh, somebody wants alone time with mommy. Oh, no. Oh, no. Hi, if you're new, I'm Sasha. I, uh, I wrote a book called The Prince of Oregon, and you can get it on all the places. Since you buy the books and sell them personally, why is that a better route? Um, so... It sounds like you're trying to be offensive when you say that, but it actually is available on Kindle, Kindle Unlimited, and on the app that sounds like a rainforest. But if people want them signed, they have to come to me first so that I could physically sign them. Because if it goes directly from Amazon, there's no way that I can touch it first. If you're not, I would seriously consider reconfiguring your tone of voice when you're talking to people because when you don't know someone and you start a phrase with the word sis, it sounds offensive because that's a familiar phrase. And generally out in the world, when someone says sis, if they don't know you, it's an insult. Just as an FYI. You might not have known that, and that's okay if you didn't know that, but that is how the world works. And I am also not your sister. You meant did? Okay. We'll see. Anyway, in order for me to sign them, they have to come to my home first because I cannot sign a book that does not come to my home or place of employment. Morning. Reaction watching the news at the bar. Aw, you're all the way to the news at the bar already? Whoa. Whoa, 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 whoa. Jen doesn't believe. Jen is a non-believer. Hey, Ray. Jen is a non-believer. My dad has requested I buy another book from you, signed by you, and see. Um, Cindy, I owe you one anyway, so don't purchase another one. Just give me a second until I have them, like, the one. Because here's the problem, Cindy. All the ones I pre-ordered are going to have the misprint of your name. So wait until all of these have come through, and then the new stuff has taken effect and then we'll get one when it's correct, right? That makes more sense, yeah? Because it needs to, it, the, the ones that were already ordered aren't showing the, the correction. That's the problem. Um, so we should wait, right? That makes more sense. We should wait till it's fixed. I don't trust people, but I have typed this instead of did. That is true. That is true. That's a fair point, Becca. That's what we'll give the benefit of the doubt. Yeah, yeah, no, I'll get one for your dad. 
not a problem. We can make that happen. We can make it happen. I can make books happen for all the peoples. Hopefully it will start going faster when the AZ apps are, do you see that? Whoa, steamy. Um, when the AZ app starts sending them to me sooner, I don't know. Steamy. Someone convinced me to buy these tickets. Oh, um, Cindy, I'll go with you. I'll go with you. And Mina will come too. Right, Mina? Right? We're all going. Let's go. Where is it? Can I come? I want to go. I will go. I don't want to go to Texas. See your fiance's in the shower, which means we can do a circle of the whole room. Whoa, I don't have to hide you guys. Look at this dill plant. This dill plant is out of control. It like is overtaking its siblings like insanity. The basil is doing pretty well also, but this dill, look at this. This is my hand. This is the dill. This is so much dill. So much dill. Um, and then the parsley. So small, so small parsley, so much dill. And also the Monstera, as usual, thriving. I did not do this. The plant came with that owie. I did not do that. Yeah, dill, dill, don't have to wrap them if your aim is to go faster. Yeah, no, seriously. Um, all right. So, I have a random question. Can I put Aquaphor on my ear? I believe yes. I believe yes. Oh my God, it's been a minute since I've seen the Monstera. The Monstera is huge. It's a huge Monstera. Humongo. Yes, who has piercings and can answer this question for Tressa? Honestly, Tressa, if no one here can answer the question, I will ask my sister-in-law. Um... You just got a new monster. Are you gonna put it on the shelf that I got you? I hope you do. You're also coming to Lim uh, San Francisco. Oh, wow. You're on a tripod. You're definitely on a tripod. You're on my travel tripod, actually. This is the one that collapses. There's one that lives in the slime room. This one collapses and goes with me wherever. It's the one I keep telling Zelda she should get. Because it's so cheap. It's so good. Cost me like $11. Aquaphor is fine. Just make sure you disinfect first. Okay, there you go. Hey, Casey. Uh-oh, we're getting conflicting information. We're getting yeses and nos. Uh-oh. I don't know. Maybe we should ask my sister-in-law because she's actually like a professional. Professional what? Well, she's a tattoo artist. Uh-huh. Yeah, let's ask Rowan. Tressa, just message me and remind me after this to, to text Rowan and see what she says. She uses a lot of aquaphor. Um, aquaphor? Yeah. What's that? Stuff that you put on tattoos generally when they're healing. Uh, Among other things. Somebody with an infected tattoo? No, she has a, a new piercing, but usually tattoo parlors do piercings, so she could ask someone there. Uh, Tressa got a new piercing and it's just scabby. It's what? Scabby. Yeah. And she wants to know if she can use Aquaphor on it, and there's conflicting information in the chat, and so I said, well, let's go to a professional, like, it's... What's the internet stuff? Um, I don't know. Kristen uses Aquaphor for her lips, whoa, like for chapped lips, I bet that really works. Yeah. All right, um, let's read a book. You like my hoodie? Oh, thanks, it was a present. It was a gift from someone whose name's under the B and ends with an echo. I know this one. You know it? Quebec. Quebec? <laughs> Quebec. That doesn't start with a B. Quebec. 
Oh, okay, Jen. All right, so it, it, it might just be fine, um, Teresa. Aquaphor would hold bacteria. Oh, interesting. Interesting. All right, so Mina is off to read The Prince of Oregon, which I wrote. If you're new here, feel free to purchase it, or you can download it on Kindle Unlimited for free. Um, people are reading it on Kindle Unlimited because I can see the pages going up every day. It's very exciting to watch, like, as people read. You can see them. It's kind of fun. Uh, bacteria loves wet stuff except honey. Bacteria hates honey. I did. That's pretty good, Becca. I'm not mad about that. All right. Um, we are here. It is cool that you can see it. I like it. I like that you can see how many, how many, um, pages people are reading each day. Since the book came out on Kindle Unlimited alone, 1600 pages have been read of the book. Casey, of course, of course. Is everyone okay? That's just secret fiance doing some dishes. He can't hear how loud it is because he's got his headphones in. Um, no, we know where the deal gets its attitude. Yes, from its father. Um, so we are going to Kindle book pages to count towards your goal. So Kindle is its own per, this is, this is, I had to learn this too, Grace. So if you, hey, Catherine. If you, yes, Casey, you can definitely get an autographed copy. That's not a problem at all. So while he's making all the noise on the planet, I'll explain the three different, the four different things. You can get the paperbacks from me, which obviously is just what it is. You can get the paperbacks from Amazon, which is what it is. You can get Kindle copies, which are its own thing. And then Kindle Unlimited is its own thing that goes by page. So when you're reading it on Kindle and you own it on Kindle, they don't count the pages, they just count the individual purchase. If you're reading it on Kindle Unlimited, they count the pages, which is interesting, right? Um, yeah, but Casey, you can just get it on Patreon. Casey can get hers, she doesn't have to do TikTok drop. She can do Patreon. What's this? What's, what's going on over here? Um, Casey, um, it's on Patreon on the special page for just the Patreon people. Um, and that automatically comes signed and gives you a place to say like who you want it signed to and all that stuff. Um, because some people bought them as gifts, um, such as Anya and other people who are in book clubs, like bought them as like gifts to their favorite, like book club friends or whatever like that. Ooh, rude. A favorite book club friend. Is it Casey or Cassie? That's a great question. Is it Casey or Cassie? I feel like we went over this before. Is it Casey or Cassie? Didn't we do this? I feel like we've done this. It's Cassie. It's Cassie Lee. It's not Casey. I said Casey, but I knew it was Cassie. I knew it because we've done this before. See, this is the one really hard thing with me only being able to read it is that everyone pronounces their name differently, you know? And so I can't hear you saying it, so I have to just like parse it out. All right, so... We're reading chapter eight of book six of the Land of Stories. Chapter eight. Per General Wilson's orders, the US Marines began excavating every building, excuse me, not excavating, evacuating, not excavating. Why would they be excavating New York City? Began evacuating every building within a 10 block radius of the New York Public Library. Watching the soldiers move from building to building and forcing people out of their homes and businesses made Connor feel like he was watching a scene from an apocalypse movie. Judging from the looks on the New Yorkers' faces, everyone knew the situation wasn't a gas leak. Something far worse was happening in Midtown Manhattan. The homeless man led Connor and his friends covertly from alley to alley, careful not to attract the attention of the Marines. With every step, Connor wondered if they were doing the right thing by following him or if they were putting their trust in a complete lunatic. My name is pronounced like Tony the Tiger, only Grace. <laughs> I knew that. Where are you taking us? Connor asked. Shh, the homeless man said and placed a finger over his mouth. 
If they catch us sneaking around, we'll never get to your sister. Sorry, where are you taking us? Connor whispered. We're going to the subway entrance on the corner of 40th and Broadway. We're taking the subway? Connor asked. But won't the train, how would the train get us? But We're taking the subway? Connor asked. But won't, why can't I read this sentence? We're taking the subway, Connor asked, but a train won't get us inside the library. There we go, I got it. Wow, that was hard. Reading is hard. We don't need a train where we're going, the homeless man said. The homeless man dashed across the street to hide behind a pile of trash and the others followed him. They moved from building to building very slowly, only crossed streets when they were certain no Marines were watching. By the time they reached the intersection of 40th and Broadway, Midtown Manhattan was practically a ghost town and it was getting dark out. After a quick huddle behind... <laughs> I wish he could hear me. <laughs> He's washing the cutting board. After a quick huddle behind a large delivery truck, the homeless man raced across the intersection to the southwest corner and hurried down the steps into the subway station. A moment later, he popped his head up and whistled to the others. The station's empty, he called them. All right, well, the coast is clear. Connor and his friends joined him underground. Their footsteps echoed off the station's tile walls. The homeless man jumped over the turnstile to avoid paying, and the others copied him. Red was the least agile, and her gown got caught in the revolving turnstile. Goldilocks had to slice off a layer of her dress to set her free. Now everyone follow me to the end of the platform, the homeless man said. Wait, Connor said. We aren't going further until you tell us exactly where we're headed. Kid, I promise it'll make sense once we're there. But until then, you just have to trust me. The homeless man reached down. Nope. The homeless man reached the end of the long platform and jumped down onto the tracks. He can't be serious, Bree said. We're not actually going to follow him down there, are we? What choice do we have? Connor asked. I know, it's wild. I'm like, he needs to... I'm waiting for him to turn around so that I can wave in his direction. I was waiting for you to finish. What's wrong? I was waiting for you to finish. Yeah. Well, finish what? <laughs> All the noise. Uh, have you it's not been reading so the whole time? Loud. I was trying, but I couldn't focus. Oh. Uh, the noise. Uh, have you it's not been reading so the whole time? It's so loud. I was trying, but I couldn't focus. Uh, Can you guys see me? Is it working? I got a little alert that my Wi-Fi... No, it wasn't you. No, no one called. It was just Wi-Fi. It said Wi-Fi was having an issue. Okay, we're good now. Connor, Bree, and Jack jumped off the platform and then offered their hands to help Goldilocks and Hero, but Red took their hands first. The homeless man removed a flashlight from inside his coat and sprinted down the train tunnel. You might want to hurry. Trains usually run through here every 10 minutes, he warned. Fearing a speeding train would hit them at any moment, Connor and his friends ran after the homeless man as fast as they could. The farther they went, the darker the tunnel became. Soon the shaky light from the homeless man's flashlight was all that was keeping them from tripping over the train tracks. Suddenly, the homeless man made a quick left turn and disappeared from sight. When the others caught up with him, they entered a different tunnel they would have a, they entered a different tunnel that they would never have spotted on their own. Unlike the previous one, the new tunnel had no visible cables or train tracks on the ground. Welcome to the Calvin Coolidge Express, the homeless man announced, or at least what's finished of it. The what? Connor asked. The homeless man chuckled. Don't worry, very few people know that this exists, he said. In 1928, construction began on a new transit system to take New Yorkers from Staten Island all the way to Central Park. Following the Great Depression, following year, the Great Depression hit. 
and construction came to a halt. Later, the need for steel was so high during World War II that the plans were scrapped altogether. By the time the war ended, the Calvin Coolidge Express was completely forgotten. Whatever it is, it smells awful, Red said. She took the can of Febreze out of her purse and sprayed the air around them. Yeah, well, unfortunately, the tunnels were built right beside the sewers, but you get used to the smell after a while. Why would you bring us to an abandoned tunnel? Connor asked. Because one of the many stops planned for the Calvin Coolidge Express was Bryant Park, the man explained. The city didn't want to obstruct the park, so they decided to place the stop in the basement of the New York Public Library. Connor's face lit up so much that he practically glowed in the dark tunnel. He heard the man loud and clear, but it sounded too good to be true. Wait, so you're saying that we can get into the library from this tunnel? He asked. Like I said before, they aren't guiding every entrance, the homeless man reiterated. See why I didn't tell you where we were going? You wouldn't have believed a bum like me until you saw it with your own eyes. Connor was embarrassed to admit to himself, but the homeless man was right. If he had been just a tiny bit more critical of their guide, they would have been rounded up and sent away like every other New Yorker in Midtown Manhattan. I just realized we haven't been properly introduced, he said. I'm Connor Bailey, and these are my friends Bree, Jack, Goldie, Red, and their, uh, Jack and Goldie's son, Hero. What's your name? The name's Rusty, Rusty Basagarian, the homeless man said with a quick bow. Thank you so much for leading us here, Rusty, Connor said. How do you even know that this tunnel existed? Yeah, well, you learn a lot about the city when you live on the streets, Rusty said. Have you always been poor? Red asked. Red, don't be rude, Goldilocks reprimanded her. It's all right, I get that all the time, Rusty said. Homelessness is a recent chapter for me. I used to live in Brooklyn, and I worked at a, as a janitor at the Bellevue Castle in Central Park. A couple of months ago, I was fired, and I lost everything. Why were you fired? Jack asked. Well, to put it bluntly, I saw something magical, and it changed my life forever. Was it Hamilton? Red asked. I keep seeing signs about him posted all over the city, and if he's anything like Shaky Fruit's Hamilhead, well, I hope we get the chance to meet him. The others all rolled their eyes and ignored her. Earlier, when you told us about the library, you mentioned it wasn't the first time you'd seen magic in the city said. I don't think you were being serious then, but I'm really interested to hear about it. Rusty let out a deep sigh before telling them. Clearly, it was a difficult subject for him to talk about. It happened a few months ago when I used to work night shifts at Belvedere Castle, he said. I was in the middle of cleaning the joint when this strange vibration suddenly came out of nowhere. I figured it was just an earthquake and I went back to work. But when I got home, none of the morning noon stations were reporting an earthquake. I had convinced... I was convinced I had just imagined it, but a few weeks later, that vibration happened again. The second time was much stronger and lasted longer than the first. I called the police to report an active fault line, but they assured me it was just a subway running underneath the castle. However, when I got home, I looked at a map. I saw there weren't any subways running underneath the castle. However, wait, sorry. The rumbling didn't happen again until a few weeks later. The third rattle got the castle so hot it shattered the windows and left cracks all over the floor. I was nearly knocked off the balcony I was cleaning, and I remember it didn't feel anything like an earthquake or a train, but something enormous was hatching from an invisible egg. I looked up, and that's when I saw it. Saw what? Connor asked. The best way I can describe it is a window into another world. Rusty said, for a brief second, I saw a huge forest of evergreen trees and a bright starry sky. It looked like something out of a story, but couldn't have been more different than the hustle and bustle of New York City. Then the window disappeared just as fast as it had appeared. Connor and Brie exchanged a grave look. Without any solid proof, they knew exactly what Rusty had witnessed. The bridge between the worlds was starting to form. Yeah, I went to the police station and filed a report about what I saw, but none of the officers believed me. A copy of the report was sent to the castle's property manager, and they fired me. They thought I had caused all the damage myself and was making up a ridiculous story to cover it. Word about my police report spread all over town, and no one wanted to hire me after that. That's terrible, Bree said. Did the window ever appear again? I didn't see it again, but others have seen it appear all over the city, Rusty said. Okay, but who and where, Connor asked. You can ask them yourself, Rusty said. Follow me. 
They continued down the Calvin Coolidge Express line, flickering lights coming into view ahead, and soon they discovered a vast underground campsite that was home to dozens and dozens of homeless people. The tunnel was full of tents, sleeping bags, and furniture made from cardboard and newspapers. The homeless people were spread out through the camp in groups. Some kept warm, standing over blazing trash cans. Some played musical instruments, and some watched a man teaching a family of rats to fetch. Rusty escorted Connor and his friends to a group who sat in the corner of the camp. The group included an older man in a blue suit, a woman in a fur coat, another woman in a Yankee baseball hat, and a third woman wearing a t-shirt that said, Red Band Books, and a tinfoil hat wrapped around her head. They were gathered around a radio listening to Apache broadcast. There you are, Basagarian, the man said. We heard there was an evacuation in Midtown and we were worried that you got swept. Connor and company, allow me to introduce you to my underground family, Rusty said. This is Jerry Oswald, Annette Crabtree, Judy Harlow, and Roxy Goldenberg. I hope you aren't from the papers, Judy said and hid her face behind her collar, the collar of her fur coat. If I get included in another one of those savage where are they now editorials, well, I'll just die. For the hundredth time, Judy, you aren't famous, Annette said. How dare you, Judy said. I was on Broadway. It was off Broadway and it was the 80s, Roxy reminded her. No one is looking for you now. They're not reporters. They're just trying to get inside the public library, Rusty explained. But since we're passing through, they want to hear the stories about what you've seen about you know what. Rusty's friends were just as mortified as if he had disclosed a nasty secret. They looked around the tunnel to make sure no one else had heard him. Why do you have to always go and bring that up? Jerry asked. They'll only mock us like the rest of the world, Judy said. Haven't we been through enough already? Annette asked. Rusty's friends got to their feet and tried walking away, but Connor and Bree blocked them from going too far. No, 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 we're not going to insult you, Connor said. We just want to know what you saw and where you saw it. Please, the answers might help us a lot. <laughs> and it's not like you have anything to lose, Red added. Despite the rude comment from his friend, the homeless people sensed the sincerity in Connor's voice. They looked at one another and shrugged. Well, I used to be a maid at the Plaza Hotel, Annette said. Late one night, I went into the presidential suite for turndown service, and as I was making up the bed, the room began shaking. All the furniture was knocked to the floor, and the guests' belongings rolled everywhere. Well, the next thing I knew, a forest appeared out of thin air. It hovered in the sitting room for a few minutes and then just vanished. The guests returned shortly after and saw all their belongings scattered around the floor and accused me of stealing things. They reported me to the hotel manager and I was fired. Nobody wanted to hire a maid with a history of theft, so now I live here. Well, I was on the verge of a comeback when I saw the forest, Judy said. It had been, I had been cast as the nurse number seven in the soap opera of The Cute and the Complacent. Anyway, I was sitting on my dressing room at Rockefeller Center and that's where they filmed the show, when it was, I was hit with a terrible tremor. The forest appeared over my vanity and I screamed for help. By the time a producer came to check on me, it was gone. They thought I was crazy and had my character written out of the script. I've become the laughing stock of the Screen Actors Guild and haven't been hired since. I was a teller at the National Bank on 44th Street, Jerry said. I was working late one night and went into the vault to store a deposit. Smoothie dance time! Perhaps this will be the end of the promotion. Suddenly, the vault started to rattle. It was so powerful it knocked all the deposit boxes and money spilled onto the floor. The commotion set off the alarm and the police arrived within the hour. Had they showed up just a moment sooner, they would have seen the forest for themselves. My boss fired me for carelessness and I couldn't find another job. I told my wife what happened, but she didn't believe me either and threw me out of the house. Everyone turned to Roxy Goldenberg, anxious to hear her story next. Why are you looking at me? I never saw the forest appear. I live down here because I hate paying taxes. Connor sensed that there was a pattern to the homeless people's encounters. He paced back and forth as he thought about the information they had provided. How long ago did each one of you see the forest appear? 
he asked. Four months ago, Rusty said, and then scratched up his brow. As a matter of fact, it was uh, four months ago to this very day. What a coincidence, Annette said. I saw it exactly two months ago. Precisely one month ago for me, Judy said. Two weeks, Jerry said. And how long did the operation last, Connor asked. Only lasted a few seconds at the castle, Rusty said. It was quick, I'd say a minute or two, Annette said. Fifteen minutes at least, Judy said. Uh, about 45 minutes, I would expect, Jerry said. Interesting, Connor said. So the sightings are happening faster and faster, and each time the apparition appears to stay twice as long? Thank you. Oh. Delicious. Yum, yum, yum. That was funny. <laughs> if it continues in this pattern, it would put the next sighting tonight and it could stick around for an hour or two. I just wish we could tell where it was gonna be. An idea popped into Bree's head and she gasped, startling Jack and Joel Goldilocks beside her. Actually, I think the locations may be just as predictable, she said. Bree looked around the tunnel and snatched a map off the sleeping homeless person. She spread it out against the wall of the tunnel and had Jack and Goldilocks hold it in place. Mr. Oswald, what street was National Bank on again? She asked. Uh, 44th and 5th Avenue, Jerry said. And Miss Harlow, where's Rockefeller Center located? Between 48th and 51st Street, Judy said. And the Plaza Hotel is at 59th and 5th, Annette said. And Rusty, I know there are no streets in Central Park, but if Belvedere Castle were on a street, what would it be? Bray asked. Well, that's easy, Rusty said. It's just north of the 79th Street Traverse. Bree pulled a marker out of her pocket and made a note of all the locations. Once she was done, she took a step back and studied the map. Just what I thought, she said. The bridge first appeared on 79th Street at Belvedere Castle. Next, it appeared at the Plaza Hotel exactly 20 blocks south. I thought, she said. The bridge first appeared on 79th Street at Belvedere Castle. Next, it appeared at the Plaza Hotel exactly 20 blocks south. Half of the ground that it did before. So everything is a pattern. Did it go weird again? I just saw a thing that said I lost connection. Did it happen again? I got an alert that was like, your Wi-Fi is unstable, which I don't understand. It did. Why is this happening? Literally, today is like chaos incarnate. That means that we can trace when and where the bridge will appear next. According to the formulas, what, would, what place would the appearance what would place the next appearance tonight at two and a half blocks south of National Bank on 44th Street? Goldilocks go. So what's located between 41st and 42nd Street? Connor and Bree traced the map and their fingers arrived at the same spot at the same time. They exchanged a long, fearful glance before turning to the others. The New York Public Library, they said in unison. This practically confirms everything that we suspected, Bree said. Whoever took Alex to the library definitely knows about the bridge between the worlds, but this time, I don't think it's going anywhere. Just like the Sisters Grimm predicted, this might be the bridge's final stop. Tonight be when, might be when the worlds collide. Connor's eyes filled with panic. Rusty, you've got to take us to the library, he said. Now. Connor's eyes filled with panic. Rusty, you've got to take us to the library, he said. Now. Hello, are we back? I turned it off, I turned the Wi-Fi off. That's so weird. Why is it going in and out like that, do we think? Yeah, I was gonna read the next chapter, but I feel like the, the, the Wi-Fi just doesn't want us to read anymore. Um, Tressa, that was, the last, that was the last line. Can you take us to the library now is literally the last line of the page. Um, I was gonna read the next one, but I, I feel like it, it doesn't want us to do it. It's trying to like tell us something today. So um, we'll just come back later to do slime stuff. Later today. Yeah, not meant to be today, that's okay. Um, and we will, we will we'll come back later for slime. It's not a big deal. It's 
no big deal. Not a big deal. We will make it work. No worries. We love slime stuff. I'll see you guys later. And I hope you have a great rest of your day. Ah!